have these uh, Chinese herbal candies, <laughs> which makes sense because I, so I bought them. Well, actually, it was long long before. Thank you. So um, yeah, last night I had dinner at the, the house of former chef just Heels Court, Heels Court Justice, Justice Bavari, and he said something uh, worthy. He said, uh, you know, generalists know uh, more and more, less and less about more and more until they know nothing about everything. I actually, I feel like I'm approaching that sort of asymptotically to the point of you know, really feeling ignorant about a lot of things. But, and so I was looking through this, doing the presentation. Uh, this is probably the most ambitious talk I've ever given in terms of what I'm going to try and cover. And uh, so, I'm just going to get right to it. But, I have to tell you about one of the few chances I have to see movies was on the airplane. And I was just on a flight, not thinking about it. And a song, which I really liked otherwise, called Murder on the Orient Express. There were two that just came out. One starting, starring uh, Kenneth Branagh. You guys might know him from Shakespeare plays. And the other one starring David Suchet, who's the, the real uh, Hercule Poirot, right? You guys know David Suchet? It's actually Arab, by the way. So, the Murder on the Orient Express is Agatha Christie's story, and they're on the Orient Express, which goes from Istanbul to or something like that, the train. And uh, so Hercule Poirot starts out in Istanbul getting on the train, but of course, he's in the Muslim world, so what does he see before he gets on the train? He's walking down the street when, lo and behold, out comes a crowd with a female who they stone. Because if you're in a Muslim country, you know Every other day, someone's getting stoned on the street, right? No, that's not true, obviously. In fact, the insane thing, I'm sure this was set in the 1920s, so after the end of the Ottoman Empire, but during the five, roughly 500 years the Ottomans ruled Istanbul, there was one stoning. One stoning which was a punishment for a married person that committed adultery. So, and by the way, the stoning has to be ordered by the government. By the Muslim ruler, not by some crowd who come out and throw rocks at some poor woman. Why? Now, uh, stoning, as I said, is a punishment for a married person committing adultery in the Quran. But does that mean that no married, only one married person committed adultery in 500 years of rule of Ottoman rule in Istanbul? No. Does that mean that only one person was caught committing adultery in 500 years of Ottoman rule of Istanbul? No. A lot of people committed adultery, and a lot of people were caught committing adultery. But why weren't they stopped? The Quran, the Quran says, well, actually, the Quran doesn't say. The Prophet uh, Muhammad uh, says that the punishment for a married person who fornicates is Islam. That's the law of the Sharia, the, the God's law in Islam. Why weren't people punished according to? That is one of the questions that I'm going to answer today. Hopefully, uh, it will should entice you if you're not already interested in the subject. All right. Um, now, the, the key to understanding the answer to this question and many other questions in Islamic law is to understand the difference between hakuk Allah or hakuk al What does that mean? Hakuk is the plural of hak. Hak means a right. Well, hak means actually a lot. It can mean truth. It's one of the names of God. Is al hak the truth? Uh, it means right. It means reality. Right in the sense of I have a right to this. You have a right to that. Hakuk is the plural. So actually, today in the, in the modern Middle East, the law schools are called kulliyat al hukuk, the the colleges of studying rights. So, Hukuk Allah means the rights of God. The next, the Hukuk Al-Ibad means the rights of the slaves. You guys have heard the name like Abdullah or Abdurrahman, Abdurrahim, things like that, these Muslim names. Ab means 
slave. Eba means slaves, plural. Abdullah means slave of God. Abdurrahman means slave of the most merciful, i.e. God. Abdurrahim means slave of the most compassionate, i.e. God. People, the Quran, one of the main words the Quran, the terms that the Quran uses to refer to human beings is Ibadullah, the slaves of God. Human beings are the slaves of God. And in case any of you have read the New Testament, maybe an English translation, you see Jesus talking about the servants of God. This is actually a selective translation of the Greek word doulos, which also means slave. So the idea that worshippers of God are ter termed slaves of God, this is actually very common in the Near Eastern tradition that gave us both the Bible and the, and the, the Quran. So the Habuq al meaning, what that means is the rights of human of the slaves of God, i.e. human beings. It literally means, it's essentially human rights. It means the rights of human beings. Which is interesting, because there's a, in discussions around human rights, there's a lot of discussion of exactly when our concept of human rights, are, you know, Western, or global Western concept of human rights emerges, uh, when is the Issa term first used, and one of the first people to use the term actually is Thomas Jefferson, in an, uh, one of his letters, I think, he uses the phrase human rights. But uh, Muslims don't get credit, apparently, because they were using the term rights of human beings, human rights, from the, essentially the beginning of the Islamic legal tradition. Now, uh, we'll talk a bit about what these different two sets of rights are and how they work, but it's an, it, it helps to have in, this, in the side of our mind a distinction from the Western legal tradition, the Roman legal tradition, which we talked about this earlier, right, of public law and private law. Uh, what is private law? So private law is, if I have a contract with James, that's, we, uh, we have a legal agreement. If I go and punch James in the face, or let's not make it that dramatic. I run over his foot with my tricycle. Why would I be riding a tricycle? My heavy duty three wheeler, I run over his foot, and he says, You have damaged my body, and you need to compensate me for this. That's private law. If um, we have a disagreement over uh, employment or something like that, that's private law. If now I'm going to have to go away, deviate from you. If I'm married to somebody, uh, this is an agreement between me and her, that's private law. That's an agreement between individuals within the community. Now, the uh, dispute resolution may actually involve the state or the government, in the sense that um, when uh, I run over James' foot with my heavy duty three wheeler, four three wheeler, he might just come up to me and say, Jonathan, I just paid a big hospital bill, you need to pay me. But more likely, since I'm not going to pay him, because I'm a jerk, he's going to go to the courts and Soon, right? Um, similarly, if we have a marital dispute or a property dispute, uh, the state would be involved as an adjudicator, as a form of adjudication, forum of adjudication, but the rights involved are private rights. Okay, so what is public law? Public law is the relationship between individuals and the state, the government, or maybe between elements of the government itself. So the government's own administrative laws about how it functions, that's public law. Other things, what are your obligations to the government, paying taxes, serving in the army, things like that. All the legal uh, issues that could uh, be generated by these relationships between individual citizens or subjects of the government, these are public law issues. Right? Um, now, there can be overlap here. Uh, uh, let's say I I had an accident with one of the games for my three heavy duty. I get a baseball bat and I go and I hit James the bat. I hit him in the leg because I don't like it. He insulted me earlier. Now there's a private law. So I've damaged his body and I owe him money. But now the government's also interested. Why? Because of law and order. Like, wait a second. We can't have people going around hitting each other with baseball bats every time they get in a disagreement. So this is what we call criminal law. Criminal law means there are certain actions of violations of another person's rights that are also violations of a public right. Uh, and it's interesting if you go back to very old, like super duper old Anglo-Saxon law, you have the idea of the, the wit, or the wergeld, or the blood wit, the money that a person is worth. So if I, <coughs> I kill James, James 
James is worth a certain amount of money, and I pay his family, I confiscate his family, but I also have to pay his Lord, or our ruler, our, our Lord, our king, because I have disturbed his mund, his peace. So when you have this phrase like disturbing the peace, it doesn't mean like everything was peaceful. We were sitting around drinking bubble tea and then suddenly hit someone else with a baseball bat. That's not what I'm talking about. The peace is the order of the ruler. So when you have certain kind of criminal actions, by definition are ones that are, might be between private individuals, but involve violations of this public peace. So here, a uh, murder or killing somebody or injuring somebody intentionally has both a private law dimension and a public law dimension. Okay. Now, uh, what are the rights of God's servants? This, the whole funny that the Quran never uses the phrase uh, rights of human beings. Uh, the Prophet, as far as I know, doesn't in any explicit or reliable way say the rights of human beings. Uh, this is a concept that Muslim scholars, Muslim jurists, come up with uh, in, in the sort of about 100, 120, 130 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad in the year 632. So by the end of the 700s, they're coming up with these concepts. And they're abstracting it, they're drawing it out of the Quran, which is the revelation, Muslims believe to be the revelation of God given to the Prophet Muhammad in the Arabic language and preserved uh, until today. The Quran is a very small book. And it doesn't actually include a lot of legal material. Mostly it's about the nature of God, the duty to worship God, stories about prophetic biblical prophets and things like that, and warnings about uh, what happens when you don't do good things or do bad things, right? Uh, also, they abstract it from the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. The sunnah is the Prophet's, Muhammad's authoritative precedent, how he lived, how he encouraged other people to live, the court cases he ruled on, what he said about how you pray, how you fast, right? Um, and they abstracted from this, especially three uh, primary rights. One is what's called in Arabic, Risma. Risma means it, right to life is useful, but it's really the right to physical inviolability. So James has Risma. I, I can't kill him without just cause. I can't hit him. There's, his body is sort of wrapped in this Risma bubble that can't be violated without just cause. Um, uh, we have the right to property. So I have, I own something. No one can take this away from me without just cause. And uh, they don't articulate this explicitly, but it's always uh, referred to indirectly or in language it's not like a certain term, but it's referred to what we would call due process. You, you can't be uh, asked to pay something or told you're liable for something or told you're going to be punished for something without uh, some process by which the accuser or the plaintiff has provided evidence that in fact you uh, are guilty of this or you owe this. You have a right to defend yourself. And the burden of proof is on the person making the claim. It's very important. Um, okay. Now, as I said before, this is done by Muslim jurists. Jurists in the sense that we think about, you know, a lawyer, someone who's down in the dirt of people's everyday lives, talking about, you know, what does the Quran say about this? What do the prophets say about this? How do the early Muslims handle this? How do we understand, looking at the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, analogically, is there anything we can think of as an analogy for the problem we're facing today? What are the values or the principles that they taught? How do we apply those principles to new situations? This is the, that's what I'm talking about, jurists are down in the, on, the, on the ground, working with people. Now there's another direction by which these rights are also articulated, and that's by jurists as legal theorists. And here especially jurists uh, as people who think about the relationship between uh, what God teaches us in our revelation about human beings, about God's nature, and uh, asking questions about kind of from a theoretical, almost philosophical perspective, how do we think about what rights human beings have? If, if a human being is a creature that God creates and is then uh, accountable to God, is then uh, a subject who is addressed by God's revelation and who has certain obligations and certain rights, uh, how do we think about those rights and obligations at a, at a higher level from a question of epistemology or uh, accountability before God? 
And these two areas of law and, sort of law and theology on, on the latter part, they come together uh, in the roughly the 10 hundreds of the Common Era, and these um, the kind of theoretical, legal theoretical perspective says human beings have an inborn right to physical inviolability, that's not, they have an inborn right to the capacity to own property, they have an inborn right to due process, uh, then they articulate other ones. They have a right to religion. So human, human beings have a right to religion. What does that mean? That means you have a right to practice a religion. And no one can tell you you can't practice that religion. Uh, you have the right to family in the sense that your uh, people have a right to uh, relationships, reproductive relationships that are clear, understood, protected, protected, and then to uh, attachments to their children, children to their parents. People have a right to reason. This is unusual. What does this mean? But people, we think of it as like you're obliged to be sober. But you have a right to be sober. Because when you're not sober, when you're <clears throat> drunk or something like that, you're not, uh, although the hero of Wolf, Wolf Warrior 2, which I watched on the airplane at the beginning, he drinks a lot of alcohol. And he appears to be pompous mentis. I doubt this is actually realistically possible. But the point you have a right, you have an obligation and a right to be sober. And you know, the, the, there's supposed to be disagreement. There's a concept human beings have a right to dignity, to honor. In the Arabic is called iru, the right not to be insulted, not to be demeaned. Now, here the concept of human rights gets uh, it's a bit tricky because can Muslims drink alcohol? Anybody know? Uh, can Christians drink alcohol? Yes. So if I'm a Muslim ruler, and I have Christian subjects, they are allowed to drink. I have to protect their right to drink. As long as they don't come out in public acting, you know, a rowdy or something, like engage in diabolism. But if I, in fact, if a Muslim goes and breaks, accidentally breaks a Christian's bottle or barrel of wine, he has to compensate that Christian for the damage from the problem. Now, uh, so, actually, it's not really a human right then to reason, because I'm saying Islamic law says he has a right to drink because it's allowed in his religion. And dignity then becomes all the problematic, because, for example, in a lot of parts of Islamic civilization, it was technically illegal for a non-Muslim subject to build a building higher than a Muslim. Because this idea that, no, no, Muslims are the elites, Muslims are the ruling class, and these other non-Muslim minorities, they're welcome, we protect them, we'll make them practice their religion, but they are subordinate to the Muslims. So here, even uh, dignity starts to become something that's not absolute for every human being. But when you wonder about human rights, uh, the rights of God's servants that are universal across all human beings, right to physical inviolability, right to property, and right to due process. But we can also create rights so going back to James and I as an example, if we have a contract where James says, uh, Jack, come and uh, mow my lawn every week and I'll pay you $10 or whatever, and we sign this contract, then uh, we've actually created a right. I now, he has an obligation on me, I have an obligation on him, I can make demands on him, he can demands on me. Now, does everyone understand that? Is anyone saying, what the heck did this guy just say? Okay, I'm going to go with clear. What about the rights of God? Now, according to the Prophet Muhammad, in a, one of his sayings, in the Sahih Bukhari collection, the right of God, the ultimate right of God, is to be worshipped alone. God should be worshipped with no partner. No other gods, no demigods, no children, no nothing. Only God deserves, only the God deserves worship and veneration. But, Abstracted from this are other types, the uh, aspects of, of worship. So salah is prayer. So one of God's rights is to be, is when Muslims engage in prayer to God, that is a right of God. Uh, when they fast, salm, that is, they fast the month of Ramadan, that is fulfilling a right of God. Other things, like kafara, kafara means expiation. So, um, let's think of, well, this is easy. If I'm, uh, way Muslims are, I don't think, right? Okay, yes. So if I'm a uh, way Muslim, 
and it's Ramadan, and I am sitting there cooking my food for the meal at Iftar, and we we'll break the fast, but I say, you know what, I'm so hungry, and this kanji smells so good, that I'm going to take a bite of it, and I just don't care. I'm, I'm seized by a moment of utter desire for this food. I, I, I bought, not only have I violated, broken my fast for the day, and I have to redo that day of fasting, but I also owe expiation to God. I have to uh, either be a slave, if I have one, or uh, fast for a certain number of days, or feed a certain number of poor people. So that's an act of expiation. No one's, legally speaking, no judge, no one's going to take me to court. James is going to take me to court and say, I saw Jonathan eating the kanji before it was the sun had set, and he didn't do his kafara. This is between me and God. All right. Uh, now, there's another, and this is where you're going to, this is where we're going to recognize what I'm talking about. Another element of something that falls under the rights of God are the hadud. The hadud. The limits. Hadud means limits. The boundaries of God. These are specific crimes, specific offenses, the punishment for which is given in the Quran or by the Prophet Muhammad. These include zina. Zina means adultery or fornication. Sex outside of marriage. Sadiqa. Sadiqa is specific kind of theft. Doesn't mean theft in general. It's a specific kind of very severe theft. Khamar means alcohol. I really should say drinking alcohol, but I didn't have room in the line. Khamar means alcohol. Drinking alcohol. Khadaf means slander, especially sexual slander. So if I go and say to a woman, you... Tart. That's an English word, right? It's a tart. I don't think we use that in America. Or if I go to a man and say, you son of a... B-I-T-C-R. You son of a tart. So I... This is especially sexual slander. If you say someone is fornicated or engaged in sexual indiscretion, I, the, the zina, punishment in the Quran, is a hundred lashes. This is understood as being for unmarried people. The punishment for married people, I mentioned this come from the Prophet Muhammad, is stoning. Uh, Sadiqa, specific kind of theft, getting your hand chopped off. Uh, Khamar, this comes from the Prophet Muhammad, either 40 lashes or 80 lashes. Khadaf, sexual slander, this is from the Quran, 80 lashes. And Hiraba, Hiraba means banditry. This is like this isn't stealing, this is mugging someone and taking their, beating them up and taking their money and maybe killing them. This is really violent robbery, pretty planned violent robbery. Now, um, I just want to check something here quickly. All right. Something very important to keep in mind. God's right, you cannot hurt God. If you don't worship God, or if you worship another God, or if you say you're an atheist, or you curse God, or it doesn't hurt God. Nothing hurts God. So, if you commit one of these Hadoot crimes, you haven't hurt God. God is all merciful. As the Quran says, His mercy encompasses all things. God, as the Quran says, has ordained, has written for Himself mercy. Has ordained mercy in an hadith. The Prophet says that God's mercy supersedes, overwhelms His anger. So, what you find, and this is actually not unusual in pre-modern legal systems, you have very severe punishments for this hadood, but it's extremely hard. In fact, it's almost impossible to convict someone of these crimes. Why was only one person in 500 years of Ottoman rule in Istanbul stoned for adultery? Not because they weren't having sex with <coughs> time outside of marriage. Because in order to prove that someone has committed zina, you have to have four upstanding male witnesses who, as the Prophet said, and this may be the first time in the history of this university, it's the lecturer does this, but I have to do it. It's my academic duty to do it. The Prophet says they have to have seen the eyeliner, the eyeliner applier go into the case. That's what the Prophet says. Now you might say, well, I know I must have said all this stuff. They've got this book, this revelation that says, 100 lashes for 
education, get your hand chopped off for stealing something, yee. They, they must have, they started, oh, no, no, no. We gotta find out ways out of this. No, that's not true. This is in the Quran itself. That just a few verses after the Quran says that there's a hundred lashes for committing fornication, it says that if you do not have four witnesses and you make the accusation, you get punished with, a, with 80 lashes. It is almost impossible to convict someone of zina. They have to confess. They have to confess multiple times. Uh, even if they confess, they can retract the confession. For Sadiqa, in order to have your hand chopped up for theft, according, this is based on the Prophet's uh, additional information about this crime. The object you steal has to be above a certain value. It has to be hidden in a secure location. You uh, uh, have to, it can't be like a food stuff or anything like that. And by the way, if you think it's yours, you don't have your hand chopped off. So, unless you really want to get your hand chopped off, you're not going to get your hand chopped off because all you say is, oh, I thought this was mine. And you don't even have to have any evidence for you thinking it was yours. You just say, I thought it was mine. Does that mean that people are not punished for theft because it's almost impossible to find someone guilty of cynical? No. You just don't get your hand chopped off. You have, you have to compensate the person or pay, give that person the item back. And the judge may also add things like giving you some lashes, or putting you in prison, or giving you a stern lecture. So the Hadood, uh, why do I say law as teacher? The Hadood are not meant to be applied. In fact, they are almost never applied. There's a Scottish physician living in the city of Aleppo in Syria, which is now not doing so well. <coughs> In the 1700s, he lived there for 20 years. He says they were only, uh, theft was very rare, and when theft did occur, it was never punished by having your hands off, it was punished by what's called bastinado. You don't know what bastinado is? Yeah, well, you know, that's a lawyer. <laughs> it's when you take a, a, a reed and you hit people on the bottom of their feet. I remember it was once I was cleaning out the closet with my mom, God rest her soul. She can't get in trouble for this either because she's not alive anymore, right? We we're cleaning and I, we found this like long reed, and I, my mom said, Oh, that looks like a bastinado reed. I said, What's that? I was about maybe 10 or 12 years old. She, she explained to me what it was. I said, Oh, that's not good. That wouldn't hurt anybody. Look at this thing. She said, Okay, try it out. I laid down the bed and just whacked the bottom of my feet. It was, it was extremely painful. So I've been bastinado as part of an education process. What, why is it law? So why is law why is law here a teacher? Because even in, let's say, in the United States, there's all sorts of laws that exist that aren't applied. For example, littering. Everywhere you go in the U.S., it says, fine for littering, $5,000, or, and, or, three months in prison or something like that. Now, I actually met a guy who did get in trouble for littering, so I can't say it's, I, I've never heard of this. But put it this way, people litter a lot, and this doesn't, there's no punishment for it. It doesn't mean that... Um, because uh, what it means is that the law here isn't something that's meant to be applied. It's meant to be a teacher to point you in a certain direction about how the society and the government, as the voice for the society here, wants what they want, what shape they want that society to take, what values they want to apply. And uh, another thing, by the way, in case you're wondering, why you have a legal system that has very severe punishments, but then it's extremely hard to actually implement those punishments, so you have lower punishments. Uh, this is also the feature of uh, British law until the 19th century. You have, for example, death penalty for uh, stealing someone's uh, felt buckle, death penalty for stealing firewood, 200 different death, death penalty offenses in 1820 in England. Why? Because they don't have police force. They don't have people like the Scotland Yard guys going like, well, 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 what have we here? They don't have those guys. Right? We're in Hong Kong now, so I can make my Mickey Chan joke. They have, there's no uh, inspector, I forget what his name was, Jackie Chan, to, to investigate crimes. The only way to maintain law and order is to scare people into obeying the law. Deterrence through fear. But once you catch somebody, you don't actually want to punish them. Death penalty for uh, someone stealing firewood? No. 
So they have different methods. For example, in England, in an English court, they would say, well, the item, the value of the item to be stolen has to be above a certain amount. We're just going to pretend it's below that amount. So now you don't get executed. You just get put in a prison bar, or you just get a fine or something like that. So this is quite common in pre-modern legal systems. It's, it disappears in the 19th century in England and other places because they start having police forces and police cars and telegraphs and phones, but now you have inspectors and police stations and cops who can go around and make sure you're not speeding. So when states have the capacity to engage in investigative policing and preventative policing, they can drop the severity of punishments because you no longer have to have the severity of punishments as a means by which you deter people committing crimes. Because now there's a strong chance they'll get caught. Everybody understand? Now, I have, there's these five things. I have Zina, Sarita, Khamar, Qadr, Paraba. Everybody agrees, all Muslim jurors agrees, these are Hadoot crimes. Then they disagree on a few others. Uh, one, some Muslim scholars think that Ridda, Ridda means apostasy. Ridda means Muslim, was Muslim, then not Muslim. Muslim is a, if a Muslim renounces their faith, that's apostasy. Based on a saying of the Prophet, several sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, the penalty for a Muslim renouncing their faith is death. Why is that? Here, oh, by the way, just in case you want to know, in Islamic civilization, whether it's in North Africa or Southeast Asia or Turkey or whatever, uh, lots of people, lots of Muslims weren't uh, pious and maybe even converted to other religions. The governments didn't care. The only reason they would care is if you went out and started to promote apostasy or to go out and insult Islam or insult the Prophet Muhammad or encourage other people to leave their religion or to insult the Prophet Muhammad. Then, in fact, there's a great uh, study on this. In Egypt, in the 800s, there was a, a several Muslims who converted to Christianity. And uh, all of the ones who converted to Christianity and they went to meet local monks and the monks said, ah, you need to go out and proclaim your faith in Christ. Those people got executed. The person who he converted to Christianity and the monks said, you need to go and proclaim your faith in Christ. He said, no thanks. I'm just going to go to the monastery and study and copy books. That person was not executed. In fact, that person's father, he was a Muslim father, even wrote a letter to the ruler of Egypt and said, my son has apostatized, he's left Islam, he's committed this death penalty offense, I want you to punish him for his sin. And the ruler uh, ignored the problem. So again, you have here law as social structure. Why can a Muslim not leave their religion? Because anybody who wants to become Muslim can. The door is open. You're a Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist or you're a Hindu or an animist or whatever, and you want to become Muslim, become part of the ruling class, you are most welcome. But to leave that ruling class and to go down and prefer one of the other religions, this sort of violates the logic of how Muslims <coughs> understood the structure of their society. But again, it wasn't about religion as personal conscience. No one cares about your personal conscience because no one can see inside your brain. It's about how if you start manifesting this in a way that's public, publicly disruptive. Okay. Anybody have any questions? I know you want to Q&A at the end. Some of you looks like I can't deal without having this question. Yes. So you're saying is they promote atheism because otherwise people aren't going to believe in climate change, aren't going to prevent climate change. Something like that, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to formulate it because I'm just thinking about, you know, the U.S. because they are Republican, they Christian evangelists it seem like they're very anti um, climate change. Yeah. And and so if someone's an atheist, for example, um, Neil Tyson. So let's say he, he's an atheist and he, he promotes it because he thinks law. Being an atheist means law. And we have predisposition. Uh, okay, I 
understand what you're saying. So what I would say here is, so kind of stepping into, I'm now going to be like this walking Islamic law slash Islamic state, not ISIS, but Islamic government robot, right? That is not allowed because uh, if you want to promote these things, that's fine. But how can the belief in God, the creator, how can that ever, uh, how can that belief be an impediment to good? It can't. You cannot have somebody who seeks good but thinks that somehow you have to deny God to get there. It doesn't make, it does not compute. Now, and I would, my, my personal answer would be, I'm not saying you're saying this, but let's say someone makes this argument and say, yeah, there's been a lot of great atheists. For example, Stalin. He was a great atheist. Or, you know, Hitler. I mean, these people were, uh, I would say that, uh, I would simply say that atheism is in no way necessary. So I would, I would, the, the answer is, the answer is, right, uh, and here's where it's important to the Islamic like, legal conception of the world, right, uh, public-private divides extremely important. So if you personally are atheist, and you sit around with your friends in a coffee shop and talk about how stupid religion is, you can even write poetry about it. We don't care. In fact, one famous Muslim, Abu Nadal al Mahdi died 1048, died 1058, sorry. He said, you know, uh, right? the, world, the people of the world are two types, people with religion and no brains, and people with brains and no religion. This guy died a natural death. So Muslim rulers, Muslim jurists didn't care as long as you weren't going out promoting this idea. And they, they, they said, look, I'm, atheism had no value it can't have value because it's denying, it's denying truth. So if you want to be an atheist, if you, this person wants to be an atheist, and you want to have a little atheist club, that's fine. The second your club starts agitating, starts publicizing that information, it's not going to be good. Okay. Um, and by the way, I think this is interesting because one of the kind of post sort of Rousseauian, or you might even call it a Protestant uh, ethic about belief is that uh, you have to be sincere to yourself. And public demonstrations of sincerity are essential for faith to exist. That's not the Muslim understanding of faith. Uh, of course, your personal sincerity is judged by God. But the public square is also a, a space imbued by religion because that religion gives us our moral, our morals. And so you're this atheist public display of their sincere selves is not something between them and God. It becomes a damaging factor to the rest of society. All right. Now, another element. Rights of law is general public rights. So what you, a synonym for the rights of God is what's called These are the rights of the generality, the rights of society. And society is organized by the government. It's very important to remember that the government, as pre-modern jurists understood it, is not like, uh, let's just, I'm just going to use the American, it's not the modern American government that tells you how much taxes you have to pay, that tells you what color you can paint your house or not, that gives you a driver's license, that tells you, uh, has public education, where they decide whether they're going to teach your children or not, right? being a bit general here, but the government is a very small thing. Pre-modern states basically just collect taxes and provide bare minimum law and order in general, especially in big, expansive empires. Uh, most of human society is uh, organized at the family level or the extended family level or the community level through civil society, through charitable giving, <coughs> through organization. But certain things
things that are part of this general right. So, it, as the, the, the government sort of stands in as a representative for God here, uh, taxation, foreign policy, how you deal with minorities, these are all up to the Muslim rulers. Now, there might be restrictions on this that are set by the Muslim jurists who define Islamic law. So you can't be, have, impose excessive taxation. You have certain rights and obligations to religious minorities. But, for example, if you just, if you want to, if, it's a, if a Christian community comes and says, we want to build a church, or we want to re, refurbish our church, it's up to the ruler to decide whether he uh, wants to do that. <coughs> Ultimately up to the ruler. Okay. Uh, another area that falls under the right of God as a general right is uh, slavery. Why? Because only God can take people's freedom away. All human beings are born free, and no one can be enslaved, except if God gives permission for that. In the case of Islamic civilization, uh, Muslim armies defeat non-Muslim uh, enemy outside of the Muslim realm. Those prisoners can be enslaved. But uh, that, that, that those people's status as slaves is the right of God. And as the Prophet says in one hadith, God wants freedom. And as a, le a legal principle that's later established by Muslim jurists is, God, the lawgiver, looks expect expectantly towards freedom. So what does this mean? That means that if I'm a Muslim, and I have a, if I have a slave, right? And I, I used this example yesterday, sorry for repeating it. But if I say to him or her, okay, clean up the stuff today, and then after that you're free, go into whatever you want for the rest of the day. That, the, the issue of the word, you're free from my mouth, boom, that person's free, even if that's not what I intended. Because God wants freedom. If I say to my slave, come here, son, boom, he's automatically free. Why? Because you can't own your own children. And I call them son, even though I didn't mean it. So there's a huge incentive to, and kind of a easy uh, process of emancipation of slaves, because God owns his, their Freedom is God's right, and God wants them to be free. Okay, again, we talk about this idea of public law, that there are certain actions that might be actions between two, so if I go and respond, and I kick him in the head, and injure him, I've done him, in Islamic law, I've done him a private wrong, he can recover damages to his body from me. If, sorry, respond, if I kill respond, his family may come and say, you owe us compensation for his life. But you also have the public law element. So it is, for, here, think, think of this as an example. The way that Islamic law, and actually if you go back to very early Roman law too, it's just not uncommon for human societies to think this way, that they think about injuries as injuries between people and between families. But the second you have states starting to emerge, there's that state interest in public order, in the peace. So let's say Ruslan comes to America. We did a movie about it. Although he's already been there. But he comes to America, and uh, in fact, he doesn't even have any family members, even back here in Hong Kong, comes to America. Who is gonna, I say to myself, who's gonna bring the claim if I build this guy? I can get away with murder of Scott Free because he doesn't have anyone to, anyone to make demands on me to recover that wrong. Wrong. If you don't have anybody, the government steps in and becomes your relative, becomes your agent, becomes your guardian. All right. Now, this gets to away from these sort of dramatic issues of law. Everyone understand what I just said? All right. Uh, this settings of law here become extremely important. In Islamic civilization, this is, Islamic civilization is a big place. You're talking, you know, West Africa, Southeast Asia, steps of Russia to Maldives, East Africa, over, over a millennium. I'm going to be making generalizations, but they're pretty accurate generalizations. I'm happy to defend them if anybody should challenge them. You have, in general, two main settings for where law is applied. One is the Qadi courts. The Qadi, or Qadha, Qadha means ruling, judgment. The Qadi is the judge, the Muslim judge. This is a Muslim scholar, legal scholar, and he's been appointed uh, to this job 
by the Lord. The other setting are what's called siasa courts. Siasa means politics. It means politics, for example, if I'm in, if I'm in the Arab world and I say, I don't have the initial siasa in Egypt. That means I don't like politics. That's what you'd say, you'd use the word siasa. But it's not just siasa in the sense of politics, it's also siasa in the sense of policy. What is a policy towards this issue? It's also siasa in the sense of administrative law, taxation, uh, camel speed limits, whatever, right? Uh, it's also siasa, going back to Roman law, in the sense of imperium. The Roman law concept of imperium, that's where we get the word empire, imperial, all sorts of stuff. Imperium is the right to command and the right to punish those who do not obey your commands. It is the stuff of rule. Siasa. It is the executive authority of the Muslim rule. So, we want to think about two different, sort of, two sets, two twin sets of things. One is qadha versus sulta. These are Arabic words. Qadha means the judging of the judge, the qadi, who's in the qadi court. The qadi court is a court in your village or your town or your neighborhood uh, in Baghdad or in Cairo or in Istanbul. And the qadi court sits there and people come in all day and maybe into the night saying, I changed owed me 20 bucks. Ruslan killed one of my chickens. Uh, my wife says that I'm not giving her enough money and that she, I'm driving her crazy. My wife isn't cooking food that I find tasty enough. Uh, I have an inheritance dispute with my cousin. I, in, I, my ancestor instituted a pious endowment, a waqf, and uh, I'm supposed to be the one in charge of it. My brother's claiming he's supposed to be in charge of it. These are the kind of things the Qadi board deals with. The, the Qadi applies uh, is appointed by the ruler, by the sultan. So this qadha and sultan, sultan is political authority. So we get the word sultan, the power, means literally the authority. And then this maps onto fiqh. Fiqh means jurisprudence. Fiqh means law, not in the sense of like the idea of law, rule of law, uh, legal theory. No, this is law like go to a book of property law at page. On page 32, it says, if someone takes something above this amount of money, that's law in the sense of what you find in a book of law. What the judge is actually going to sit there and apply. That's fair. Fair is derived from the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet, early Muslim precedent, traditions of legal reasoning that Muslim scholars develop. It's a human product. It is fallible, and it is plural. So, in Sunni Islam, for example, after the 1200s and 1300s, you have four schools of law, four different bodies of law. They might agree on one third or something of all issues and then disagree on the other and the rest of the issues. So, in Morocco, you'd pray like this, standing like this. In Egypt, you'd pray like this. In Saudi Arabia, you'd pray like this. In, one th in, in, Morocco, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia, when you go down to pray, you come up like this, you raise your hands. Whereas in Istanbul, you would go down like this and come up and not raise your hands. This is an issue of law, where it might be about some issue of marriage or divorce. All there's disagreements between these different methods or schools of law. So the judge, the Qadi, is sitting in the Qadi court applying his method. Then there's the ruler, the Sultan. What does he do? He appoints the judge, and he can actually. Rulers don't create fiqh. Rulers don't create law in the sense of legislation or producing jurisprudence. And they don't apply the law. The judge, the, the quality applies the law. But rulers, and this especially starts to be the case after the 1000s of the common era, and then really after the Mongol invasions in the 1200s, and into like the Ottoman Empire, you have a lot more rulers' involvement in the, uh, the, 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 the functioning of law. So for example, in the Hanafi school of law, which is you find in Turkey or amongst way Muslims, Central Asia, it, there's two rulings about whether a woman needs her guardian's or her father's permission to marry. One ruling says she does, one ruling says she doesn't. The main ruling is she does not need her guardian's permission to marry. Now the Ottoman Sultan, the Ottoman Sultan, which ruling do you think he picked? 
Uh, is a domino. If we're going to say you need to use the ruling that says the woman needs a guardian's permission. The ruler can also do something very interesting. It's called chapter mubah, which means restricting the per permissible. You're not declaring something forbidden in <laughs> God's eyes, but you're restricting something. For example, you're, insert, you're uh, applying a speed limit. You're saying people have to drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road. You're saying I'm, you can't smoke. The smoking is causing public health hazards. That's the type of rules that come out of siyasa. There's also so there's the Qadi court, and there's actually courts where siyasa is applied. One is called Jara'in court. The words change in Islamic history, but this is a good word. That means a crimes court, a criminal tribunal. So if, sorry, Ruslan, if I kill Ruslan, I'm not going to get taken to the Qadi court because the Qadi doesn't have the authority to deal with this. I get taken to the criminal crimes tribunal. Who is going to be presiding over it? A copy, another judge, but this judge is functioning by different rules. And this judge is doing the job of representing the ruler's protection of law and order. The judge is still going to be applying one of those schools of law, but it's a different forum. And then you know something else very interesting? This is exactly like the equity court in the British legal system. The Mazalam court, Mazalam or Mazalam means a court of grievances. So let's say, uh, I've taken my case, to, to, uh, James has uh, you know, refused to mow my lawn, as we agreed, and the judge, inexplicably, has not come to the correct conclusion. I have been done a wrong. This is like an appeals court. I go to this Mazalim court, which is usually held in the ruler's palace or court or somewhere, or a place picked by the ruler, and there's the Grand Vizier, or there's some, and there's always a quality of Muslim scholar who's there to actually provide information on the law. And there, they deal with this appeals case. Why? Why do you have different forums? Different fora. Because judges and rulers have different jobs regarding their duty to protect the rights of the servants of God. Rights of the slaves of God. The Qadi in the Qadi court has a lot of restrictions on what, so for example, the judge in general in Islamic law, in general, the judge is not allowed to rule by what he knows, only by what the witnesses say. So let's say uh, James, Professor Franco, I'm sorry, James has, uh, I see him in an alley roughing up Ruslan. Give me your money. No, uh, give me your stipend. <laughs> Graduate student stipend, right? Um, I saw this happen with my own eyes. Ruslan comes to the court. Oh, you know, we have the honor. James here, Professor Franco, my advisor, rubbing me up. Do you have any witnesses? I'm like, no, I don't. Any any evidence whatsoever of this? Are your clothes ripped? No. He was really careful. He just wanted the money. I know, I know what I saw, but I can't rule. I can only rule by what the evidence shows. Why? To protect the rights of the slaves of God. Because guess what? Let's say I'm a, I'm a rotten judge. And I say, first lot, uh, I saw you doing something terrible. You owe James money. James is a deal with me. He gives me the money. He gives me a share. If I'm allowed to rule by what I know, I can say whatever I want. Oh, I'm certain that this person is guilty. I don't care what the witnesses say. I'm certain that this person is guilty. So the restrictions on the judges of power are there to protect the rights of the servants of God. But there's another flip, there's a flip side to this. This one has been roughed up by his advisor and had his, turn. his uh, small but valuable graduate student stipend taken from him and has not gotten justice for me, the Qadi. He goes to the Mavalim court. And here, the judge doesn't have those restrictions. The Qadi, same, I could be the same Qadi, but today I'm serving in the, the Qadi court. I saw it happen. Hey, uh, or you're punished. Tazir time, bastinado time. Uh, I forgot to just, uh, just describe what Tazir is. Tazir is discretionary punishment. So when you have the guy who steals something, but he says he thought it was his, so he doesn't get his hand chopped off, the discretionary punishment given by the judge is called tasir. 
And what happens is, as schools of law mature, and especially in later Muslim states like the Ottoman Empire, the Mughal Empire in India, they actually have uh, imperial manuals of tajir punishments. So you do this thing, for example, you steal a chicken, you got to walk around town with a chicken around your neck. Embarrassed, like tarred and feathered, things like that. Or you get caught, uh, sure, we're not punishing you for fornication with stoning or lashing, but a couple gets caught in bed having sex, they could be lashed 60 times, maybe. Not, not, not 100, but 60 times. This would be tazir or discretionary punishment. So do you see how the Qadi court has certain restrictions to protect the rights of the slaves and the servants of God? The Madalim court, the Madrid courts, they are also to compensate or make up for instances in which things have fallen through the cracks and someone's rights have been denied. Okay, we're getting to the... I've actually talked for a long time. James is like, yes, he's talked for a long time. But I'm, I worked on these, these slides, and if I as God my ways, you're going to sell it these slides. But these are cool. These are, wait. No, no, it's another, it's another uh, presentation. <laughs> Such is my affection for the people of Hong Kong that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the inside of which I've never done. It's so obsessive about okay, here, because when I tried to combine the two together, it ruined the colors. And there's all color code. You see this? This is the Sharia. I mean, it's a picture of the Sharia, right? But blue colored things, the rules, the laws are set by the Quran, the Sunnah, or they're set in film. Yellow or orange is discretion of the Qadi, the judge. Red is discretion of the ruler, that's Siasa. So the court of the Qadis and the scholars, well, then I mean scholars, I should have changed that. The Qadi court, al Qaf is pious endowment. So mosques, all mosques, schools, medrasas, hospitals, public fountains, old folks' homes, everything in Islamic civilization essentially until the modern period was based on pious endowments or al Qaf. This was if I'm super rich, I give a bunch of land, I say the revenue from this land is going to be used to build a mosque and pay the person to be the imam of the mosque and pay for students to come and learn there, etc., etc. And this is the theory just in perpetuity. The disputes over alcohol, disputes over inheritance, disputes over marriage and divorce. More than that, are transactions, like business transactions, contracts, property disputes, all this stuff like that. So that's all. Now, why do I have an arrow going into Tazir? Because let's say um, uh, Ruslan and Professor Frank will have a dispute over contracts, and I find that, uh, you know, okay, I, I side with, with James, but you've really got to rock. And you need to tell us. So I'm going to do Tazir of having you bastinado, five bastinado on your feet to teach you a lesson. The Hadoo, the Hadoo don't really uh, get applied, as I said. They are handled through tazir. Kasas means retribution crimes where you injure somebody or kill somebody. And <coughs> this concept of ifsat and ar on the right, this is uh, banditry. Remember that, that, that the crime of heraba, that crime of heraba, that's banditry. Or it's in general violations of public order. <coughs> now, all of this stuff. People aren't happy with it. One of the parties isn't happy with it. They can go to the Madalin Tribunal and seek equity in their appeal. Uh, the, everything on the left under that bracket is held handled in the Qadi courts, and all the other things are handled in the Jiraim courts or the Crimes Tribunal, which is under the rubric of the ruler but is, again, manned by Qadis, but here under the direct authority of the ruler. The other thing, the Qadi is not accountable to the ruler. The judiciary is effectively independent. Does everybody understand? Yes? Before, now, this is the first time I've seen the word uh, Sharia courts. So, um, what is actually the difference between uh, maybe the Quran, Sunnah, and Sharia? Okay, Shari fair enough. Because um, yeah. I know that we have Sharia, I mean, in Nigeria, we have 50% Muslim, and we have 
Sharia courts as well. So, uh, what, what are the courts? So, Sharia means God's law. Sharia means literally means the path. But it, it's the law of God. It's, Sharia is, for example, if we talk about American law, or British law, or common law, that's a unit, that's an organic whole. There might be lots of different schools, you know, how law is applied in Hong Kong might be different from how law is applied in uh, Scotland or England or something like that, but it's all British law, common law. So that's the Sharia, the idea of God's law. Now these different, fiqh is law like in actual books, how, what is actually applied. So there's lots of different fiqhs, there's different medhabs, that's, that's schools of law, that's, each of them is a different body of fiqh. But they're all part of the Sharia tradition. The Sharia is derived, the idea, and the stuff of fiqh is derived from the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet, the precedent of the early Muslim community, and different ways of legal reasoning looking to these sources. So analogical reasoning, equitable reasoning, thinking about uh, what are the principles or the aims of the Sharia, uh, things like that. Now, I have this cool idea, which is, it's going to fade to another slide. And that new slide is going to be Protestant modernization. So pay attention, it's going to be like a fade, like a Lawrence of Arabia desert scene. Well, okay. Uh, now it's here. You saw there was a lot of blue before, now there's a lot of red. What happens, and this is a process that begins in the 1800s, the first place it begins, well, it actually starts even earlier than that in British India, under British colonial rule, but in places like Egypt, in Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, it starts really in the early to mid 1800s. It's a process of statization. State starting to control a lot more. And some people might, the one idea is that this is a, they're copying Europe. It's not really true. Because European states are going through the same process at the same time. The, let's say, government of the Ottoman Empire or Egypt felt that they were acting entirely authentically as Muslims who venerate the Sharia. They were simply adopting the same kind of technologies of centralization and routinization that European states were adopting at the same time. <clears throat> so they understood what they were doing as Islamic reform you know, as if you have a new technology for, like, I saw this the, the picture of this ramen guard, noodle guard, you wear it around your face. Have you seen these before? I think it's a great idea. I want to get one. But, like, they, that the technology, the new state technology of their day, they really liked. So they were adopting this. But what happens? So you see that the role of the, uh, the, the Siasa courts have expanded tremendously. And a lot of the work of the Qadi courts now done underneath the Siasa courts. So, um, for example, one of the first things that gets grabbed up by the government is al Pak, the pious endowments. These are now going to be administered by the state in the Ministry of Endowments. Muamalat, uh, or financial transactions, things like that. These are now also sucked up under political or government courts. And these are staffed by judges that are called qadis, but these judges aren't trained in medrasas anymore. They are trained according to the new bodies of law that have been developed by these states. So here's what happens. Remember earlier I told you that the ruler can pick which law they want to apply. So let's say in the Hanafi school of law, you have two options for this issue of women, woman marrying without, with or without permission of a guardian. The, government, the ruler can say, I want to pick this one, because I think this is best. And there's different schools of law. So let's say the ruler says, you know what, I think the best thing to do isn't to take our Hanafi school of law, but to draw up something from the Maliki school of law. And the ruler can restrict the permissible. I'm going to make this, I'm going to restrict this permissible act, I'm going to institute a speed limit or something like that, or restrict people's right to move around and move the villages or something like that. Now, if the ruler started to have been more active in 
process of uh, what the law is, then the ruler can also do something like, look, um, I'm going to bring in another law. It's not technically speaking from one of our methods, but it doesn't contradict the Sharia. It just happens to be from French law. So I'm going to bring in, let's say, French law of contracts. Uh, we've spoke, we've cleaned it out, we've made sure nothing contradicts the Sharia. I'm going to institute this, this is my choice of law. So actually, under what is at least formally an acceptable thing for a Muslim scholar to do, a Muslim leader to do, the Muslim leader has brought in, let's say, Belgian contract law, or something like that. Uh, Tazir is also now set by the state. Uh, all criminal law is now just, it, for example, <coughs> Tazir, instead of the Ottomans, the Ottomans in 1858, they say instead of having our book of law that we had before that has this many bastinados on your feet, or this chicken around your neck, we're just going to bring in French criminal law. It's all discretionary, so we can bring French law. So the do it, just go by law. Which nobody really misses, because they hadn't been practiced anyway. The only people who miss them are people who say, wait a second, this state is no longer even interested in standing up for the rights of God. So the Hadood are important not because they're applied or not applied, they're important because at least having them on the books shows you care about the rights of God. And, uh, almost done, don't worry. Okay. Um, sorry. You see, also, the the laws that are uh, derived from the Grand Sunna start to get a lot less, and the laws that are implemented or uh, put in place by the ruler become a lot more. Okay. That's all I have to say. I can't believe I finished this in, well, it's actually an hour of time. It's just the longest talk I've ever given. You folks are brave. Any questions? So, um, in one sense, uh, I'm going to try and answer this in a question for you. In one sense, the uh, Islamic legal tradition is not a kind of victim's law tradition. Why? Because there's a very strong presumption of innocence. The burden is always on the person making the claim. And uh, that can be reduced by circumstantial evidence. 
like if uh, you know if I see somebody coming out of a building and with a crazy look in their eye and a bloody knife in their hand and blood all over them and they're going ah and inside the person with a stab to death like that no one witnessed it happen but that some circumstantial evidence can uh, have a lot of power but it, there's still this real need for direct eyewitness testimony uh, there's a uh, thank you there's a Distrust for things like uh, there's not a distrust, but there's a lot of concern about admitting other kinds of evidence, uh, hearsay, written testimony, things like that, documentary evidence. It would be accepted, but it would always be uh, there would always be an, an idea that we should watch out for this material. The, and as I said, this is seen as protecting the rights of the certain servants of God because. The person who's accused is, you. in order to change the status quo of that person's life and say that they owe something or they've done something wrong, you have to, you have to provide evidence for that change. On the other hand, these other mechanisms, especially things like the Maldalo Court, uh, create venues for vic victims, basically, for uh, people who have been victims but who have no one to speak for them. So one of the things about the Malvalum court that's different than the Kadi Kadi court in general cannot do suo moto. Um, the, the judge can't start a case by himself. He can't investigate something by himself. Someone has to come with a claim. Malvalum court can, can investigate things on their own. So there's a lot more space for uh, uh, victims' rights. It's not like the Sharia tradition would vehemently as recognize the rights of victims. Right? Someone who has been done wrong needs justice. But uh, they're also very, the church is also very anxious about not imposing punishments or liability on someone without evidence. I don't know how to answer it better than, than that. So is the state able to do anything to do things in that situation where they can't actually um, claim compensation from someone if they can't make their hands on someone? Is that possible? Because I'm asking this question because of the system of the ICC, which is kind of a peculiar century. They have to find someone to be able to claim compensation from. So uh, they had to find, in ISIS, they had to find someone to come and make a claim. So there has to be a perpetrator who has to be convicted first before their reparations can be made to victims. So yeah, the argument... This is a very interesting, okay, I understand. So this is, this falls under what's called, sorry to get super technical here, maybe I can use a little uh, can function. Can function. Sorry for my kindergarten. Asama. Asama means that uh, this is actually going back to the Prophet Muhammad in certain cases in his life. Uh, someone has been murdered and nobody knows where who did it. The Prophet uh, then pays out of hand his money, so he's the state, and so he pays the blood money to the family. If, and where, where would you find this in kind of the strip, right? Let's say someone is, dies in a public highway. They get killed in a public mosque, a place where there's no, we have no way to even know who might be responsible for this. The, because the Prophet said in the hadith, I am the guardian of the one who has no guardian. The state is the guardian of the They have to step in and give compensation. Now, uh, nobody, and this is, in my personal opinion, this is where Islamic law is actually more just than, let's say, American law. How it functions is some people might say somebody needs to pay though somebody needs to go to jail no nobody if you don't know who did it you can't put just can't, you can't just put someone in jail because you think it's make people happy but in terms of compensation for pain for punish for suffering you can the government can do that My pleasure. 
Maybe I can take two questions at the same time and then I'll answer them, hopefully answer them. So mine is very short, it's just a, a foundational question. Um, so, uh, thank you for your presentation, we uh, learned quite a lot, but I just wanted to know, you know the background to this, uh, the concepts you're talking about. Uh, so, uh, I'd say, is there any, what, what is the difference in terms of modern Islamic law between uh, uh, philosophical or the students
when you're talking about law as something that the government is involved in, it's uh, most, the majority of that, just in certain times, periods of history, is going to be soon. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of the sort of challenges of, well, actually, I'll just stop here. Uh, so that, that's why I focus mostly on this stuff also applies in, in Shiism, in Shiite states, but there are just not that many of them, so I didn't talk about it. And then there was a question about taking non Muslims as your allies. Uh, yeah, you can take non Muslims as your allies. Uh, according to the Prophet, took non uh, polytheists as allies against other polytheists. The issue is can you take non Muslims as allies against other Muslims? Um, Boy, I'm not a mufti. As far as I know, uh, you couldn't. I don't want to. Don't, don't don't go and like. This is as far as I understand the issue. Uh, that's why, by the way, uh, Saudi Arabia's. Wait, decision to, to ask for American help, first of all, for twice very controversial. Not just, you know, in terms of someone like Osama bin Laden, but a lot of you know, Muslim scholars do not believe in that. Um, I, I actually have two questions, uh, but you can decide which one you want to give priority to. Um, so the first one you just mentioned, you just said, I'm not a Mufti. And I think maybe some people might oh, be oops. interested. Yeah, I didn't explain what that meant. Yeah, some people might be interested to know, uh, you know, or to hear more about. I think a lot of people may have heard of a fatwa, uh, which is something that didn't come up in the in the discussion. So a fatwa is a kind of legal opinion, but where does it fit into um, the Qadi courts and the Siyasa courts? Now, I, now I, I can understand in private law that a, a legal opinion might be used in an interpersonal dispute to settle the dispute. The dispute. Or Kabi may even invoke a fatwa, right? But what about in the Siyasa courts? Uh, do our fat what role do fatwas have in the Siyasa courts? Okay. The second question? Yeah. Yeah? Um, it has to do with the, I know your recent work is on the Mazalim uh, courts. And I wonder, the Mazalim court is really fascinating um, in that it actually provides a kind of judicial oversight, right, for the, for the lower courts, let's say. Uh, or the courts of first uh, instance. Um, number one, um, what kind of oversight is there for the Muslim court? Um, you know, I'm really curious about that because the example that you gave about having sort of insider information and not being able to use that in a ruling in the absence of evidence, if that's not the case for the Muslim courts, how do we know that they're not going to be self-dealing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, to, but I should add, you know, to kind of the last question of a bit of additional information, which is that it's, you know, it's not like Muslim states didn't fight each other. So, like, for example, during the Crusades, lots of Muslim city states in the Levant and Syria and Palestine allied with Crusaders against other Muslim states, right? And the Ottomans allied sometimes with Christian states against other Muslim states. Uh, what they, the religious arguments, the Sharia arguments they would make is. Well, one way, one thing you do is say that your enemy is not actually Muslim. So, these people are so bad, they're not Muslim, right? Or, these people are engaged in, you saw this, the uh, sad thing, spreading corruption in the land. And it is my executive authority and my obligation to end what they're doing, and by necessity, I'm going to turn to the aid of non-Muslims. So the argument is necessity. And the Islamic legal principle is, uh, for example, in the Quran, if you're dying of starvation, you can eat a giant, what is kind of pork do you here? Chasu. Uh, and you run to like a chasu restaurant, you can say three orders of chasu. Doesn't even read how much you can eat. But the point is uh, necessity, the rura to be al maqdurat. Necessity makes the, per the prohibited permissible. Then to, I think that adds a little bit more flavor to our information to that question. Um, okay, 
so uh, the question, uh, first practice question was what, a, a factual and a legal, a, a religious opinion, a legal opinion. Uh, so I ask a Muslim scholar, uh, if I miss my dawn prayer, when should I make it my dawn prayer? Make it up at this time. That's a factual. If I, uh, my, someone asked me earlier, you know, if I'm uh, sitting at a table and someone's drinking alcohol there, do I have to get up from the table or not? That's a good question. That's a fatwa. We all know fatwa from the eyes of many. That just means legal ruling. What's interesting about fatwa is they're not judges. Judges don't give fatwas. Judges give rulings. Fatwas come from non-judges. But a lot of times in Islamic civilization, judges were not that smart. They weren't the brightest balls in the chandelier. And there was some huge scholar who maybe was a colleague in another court or was just a great independent scholar who was working in a medrasa or something, and they'd go and send a question to this person. Oh, great scholar, I don't know what to do in this situation. And then the person writes their fatwa. So the fatwa could become a ruling if the judge adopts it. And then that, someone's, that school of law might say, oh, this fatwa that this scholar wrote is so good, we're going to incorporate this into our body of fiqh. The, uh, but because fatwa, fatwa is just a religious opinion, so one of the things you see in the Malala courts is they'll always say you have to have muftis there. I mean, muftis is Muslim jurists who are qualified to give their opinion. Why are they there? They're there to offer their opinion on how to resolve this case. But their opinion is not binding. It only, any, the only thing that's binding, even if it's that person's opinion, only becomes binding when the judge makes it the, the, the hookup. Then it's with the oversight of the law courts, the box got to stop somewhere, somewhere, right? Eventually, there's no, I mean, ultimately, the, the ultimate overseer is God. And so there's an interesting case in um, the time of the scale of Omar bin Abdul Aziz. The, the scale of Damascus dies 720 of the Prophet, Omar bin Abdul Aziz. So he'd be very pious. And somebody comes and says, Someone's, someone's been killed, and we don't have a way of finding who did it at all. We don't know what, how, what, how to proceed. And he says, Devil Hadar, what does this mean? His, this person's blood it will go unanswered. Why? On the day of judgment, the ruler will be, the, 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 the killer will be held accountable by God. So the, the fact that all crimes, all wrongs done, ultimately will be brought before God on the day of judgment creates the oversight, oversight, the ultimate oversight. So even if you don't get justice in this life, you will get justice in the next life. Someone out there has a question for us. We out of time? No, it was oh, and the dean, sorry. Dean and then Mr. Lee. If I could, I mean, it's more or less, uh, so one uh, yes or no, very uh, technical question, then an observation on the basis of that, and then a real question. So on the previous slide, the red color indicated an increase in discretion, right? An increase in the judge's discretion. Well, or no, the red is discretion of the ruler. Exactly. So, so we're looking to uh, whoever is making the decision has more discretion and less, it's less bound by the rules. And uh, I'm asking whether in this second slide uh, it's the same, or is that simply indicating secular and, 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 and religious? Uh, yes, it is. It does, it, it does mean they have this discretion is increasing its reach. So if you go to also here. Right? So but the difference is it doesn't mean there's, no, there's less rules. It just means that they, I'm choosing, using my discretion to import French contract law. Sure. So you actually have maybe even more rules, but the, the existence of those rules is justified by the discretion of the rule. Okay, because the, the, the observation was this, that you see generally uh, in development of law, for example, if you look at James Baker's history of English law, uh, he points out, and this is why we had equity courts, right? He points out that at the beginning of British common law, you have this, these extremely rigid procedures that are almost like sort of a magic act. They don't yeah. really make sense, but you have to go through the words, yes. the specific words. And they created such injustice that you could go to the chancellor, the, the yeah. court of equity, who was usually a bishop, someone uh, educated in moral uh, teachings, 
and was the king's best friend. Uh, and so they would be very open. Uh, and uh, in the history of English law, what you begin with is an extremely rigid law, which is used because most of the people that are applying it don't have a lot of skill, right? And then if you come to the modern English law, what you have is a law that looks very much like mush. There's almost nothing that's rigid, but what you have are people who are applying it who have been highly educated uh, and are highly skilled. The kind of people that you mentioned with the fatwa, you might have someone who really knows a lot and can simply come in and, and make a statement. And it's interesting that if you look at French law, the development after the French Revolution, uh, because the courts were hereditary uh, and the, the noble who had the court would have very broad discretion, that's one of the reasons why that, those courts were eliminated uh, in the Napoleonic era uh, and the power was taken away from the civil courts so they would simply apply the laws that were enacted by the legislature, right? So you've got this, yeah. this relationship between discretion and formalism uh, and uh, the, the more that you trust the discretion, either because they're educated or they behaved well, the less the formalism. I mean, that's generally the case yeah. in legal development. And, and then my real question was, uh, how would you see that sort of schema applying to the development yeah, of Yeah, so the, the difference is, so in the case of, of England, of the common law, English common law, you have, it's almost, and I asked the same question myself, it's just like the power of tradition. Why can you, why can you not use written testimony on tradition? Why can I not make a request during my life, you know, why can I not give requested land to someone during my life so I have to maybe give it to my friend and the second I die, he gives it to the person and then if, that, if he doesn't do that, then they, my kids the, the equity court, like the kind of situations that these weird injustices that are created by these arcane twists and turns of the common law. And uh, why that happened, we'll leave that to the Kurdish people to explain. But in the Islamic tradition, the difference is it's, uh, it's enormously heretical to say that God and the prophet have created a rule that doesn't give justice, or that's so you can say it's arcane and twists and turns and it's like a magic act. You can say that when it's just about this is how poor British tradition happens to give us. But when you say this is what scholars have derived from the rulings of God and the prophet, it becomes much more problematic. So you can't, you, how can you even talk about injustice being done here if you're almost insulting God's law? So what they would say is, and I think this is correct, they'd say, look, we do have limitations on our capacity to give justice in the cause of courts, but those limitations are there to protect other injustices that might happen in other situations. Your situation is spawned with cracks, but our system is just in the end because we acknowledge that there are other people you can go to, and they would look back at examples in the Prophet Muhammad's life and say, this is sort of where he was acting as in the law in itself, and you can get justice. So the reason for the injustice happening at the court of first instance isn't because we have this weird tradition, it's because there are limitations on what the judge can do to protect 10 other people, and you are the one person who has suffered because of this. That, that is that place? Yeah. Making laws, in choosing laws, uh, choosing between different positions in legislating for things that don't really have existing laws, etc. And then when we were talking about the kukukula, you mentioned the category of ibadah, and you said that um, those are the things that are between you and God, and, and that has nothing to do with you know any of these. Um, something that can be taken into court. And the example you gave was of someone who eats um, before uh, sunset in Ramadan. But there are Muslim states where there is such legislation where there is a prohibition on eating in public during Ramadan. So does the ruler also have discretion to then meddle with the ibadat and to impose them? And then you know that also goes into states that have like a compulsory hijab, etc. So is that uh, something you can The answer is yes, because this was all it was called I didn't include this. It's another form of siyasa justice called hisba. Hisba. 
ISPA means um, it's like public police, public morality or market police. So the, when I said with the breaking the fast, what's between the divine breaking my fast, the kafar, the expiation is between these two. But if I'm outside eating, you know, I go to a restaurant in the middle of the day and I order a giant full table of food and start eating, the Hezbah is going to come and bust me because their job is to engage in the Quranic duty of al amr bin ma'ruf wa na'i an munka enjoying right and forbidding wrong. So you can't do this if this is wrong and you're publicly engaging in wrong behavior and you're creating a bad precedent and you're insulting others and you know, uh, engaging in wrong behavior. What? If you're uh, not praying in the mosque, similarly I can make you go. Now what ends up happening in reality is that you know, because there's lots of reasons someone might go not be in the mosque, they already pray, they're going to pray at home, they're a woman and they're menstruating or whatever, like, that stuff doesn't happen a lot around prayer, but things like eating fat, eating in public, like when you're sick, you know, you're sick or breastfeeding or pregnant or something, and you're, you don't have to eat, you, you don't have to uh, fast, you make up the days later, but you don't go out and eat in public because no one knows that's why, uh, they just see someone eating, it's become public and becomes disruption, insulting to them. It is the person's opening and insult, openly insulting God's law, watching this for a while. But then the, the second question was I think that was your question. Did I miss something else? That was but by the way, there's a very, again, very strong public vibe in the Bible. You don't go into people's houses. And there's a great example of this during the time of the second Caliph Omar, and then I have lots of other examples of Islamic legal history, where he hears this party going on, he's doing the hisbah thing, he's out on the streets, he's the second Caliph, and uh, he hears a big booze party, dance party going on, climbs over the wall, yells at the guy, tells him he's being punished. And the guy says, you, viol you just violated the Quranic command not to climb over people's walls without permission, not to go in their homes without permission, and to, you have to uh, offer what's called sata. Uh, you have to cover up wrongs. As long as you're not hurting somebody else, you cover up people's faults. Because you want to give them a chance to repent, and that's between them and God. You don't want to pollute the public space. So Omar is ashamed that he leaves. That's a guy I love. So there's a very strong idea that you don't go into people's private lives, into their home, into their relationships, and look for wrongs. Like, if someone's getting wronged, they have to come and say, I'm being wronged. I want justice. Yes. And the follow-up question, the deep question to the text I did not um, understand your um, answer completely. So in Islamic law, there's no underlying principle of justice, which can be used to mitigate unfair judgment, so that would be against the law of God. I'm saying, for example, about those cases where women get arrested for adultery, being delivered of rape. So the judges can uh, apply them because that would be against the law of God. Yeah, I don't understand this when this happens. It's just it's, like, I don't, this idea of people being, so if a woman gets raped, she hasn't done anything wrong. Right? Uh, the idea that you would punish someone, like she's not guilty of adultery because she got forced into it. And it's almost impossible to prove adultery to begin with. It's essentially impossible to prove to begin with. So like, I'm not sure how, this is just, Culture, like bad cultural encroaching, culture encroaching onto uh, the law, as far as I'm concerned. But we, your, your, your earlier question is actually very, 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 very interesting. This is like writing a book on this now, it's like the whole point of the book, which is um, there's a strong, and this is a certainly dominant in Sunni Islam, justice is the Sharia. Sharia is justice. They're not, there's not a really big natural law element. They are essentially a divine command. It's a divine command theory system. So what God, the definition of justice is what God commands. So if you say this law is God's law, if we, if we reliably derive these rulings from the revelation, then they can't be unjust. It doesn't make sense. However, there's, in the Quran itself, 
it gives exemptions. You can't eat pork, but if you're dying of starvation, you can eat pork. You can't denounce God. You have to believe in God. But if someone has a gun to your head, or you know, is forcing you to renounce God, you can. It doesn't matter. If you're traveling or you're sick, you don't have to fast. So there's an acknowledgement that these rules actually need exceptions to them because something is happening. There's something wrong. It has to, God wants something else in this situation. When you, once that other thing has been introduced, then you can start looking for that other thing in other places. So they say, okay, women are pregnant, they're breastfeeding. That's very much like being sick or traveling. So they also don't have to fast. So there's this, uh, the way this is thought about and articulated is through two things. One, those aims of the Sharia, so those, those rights of this, the, the five rights of the service slaves of God, life, property, family, reason, religion, and dignity. These are goods that are aimed at. Muslaha just means general good. Harm is avoided, good is sought out. How are these defined? They're defined culturally. As long as they don't contradict the Sharia. So, that drinking alcohol might make you really happy, but that can never be good because it's prohibited. Right? So, uh, in a school of law, a judge will have, let's say, several options in that school of law to choose. There's one main option, which would be the one that is the go to option on this rule. Boom, 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 boom. But let's say there's a situation where I sense something is up here. This is going to give me an unjust result. I take the other position, aiming at one of those goods. Or, less common, but, most, but this is what happens in the modern period, is you mix, dip, mix and match between schools of law. So for example, only the Hanbali school of law requires, so if, if I have a, I'm sick of using myself for anybody, if Joe Schmo has a kid, as a son and a grandson. That son dies, the grandson's still alive. When Joe Schmo dies, there's, the grandson won't inherit because the, the route between the, 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 te, the person who has the estate, the decedent, and the, the person, the son is, the grandson is cut. The Hanbali school requires that the person holding the estate give a bequest to grandchildren optional request, but it's not optional, it's required. You find that, that law is now in Malaysia, Indonesia, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, wherever. These are not highly <coughs> places. They've all taken this as a, as a good act of like mixing and matching. So uh, the plurality of the Sharia is used as a way to take alternate options when the judge or the scholar in question feels that a clear injustice or harm is being done. Does that answer your question? So you talked about like how the ruler can choose between the options that are available for any kind of issue, but so is there any kind of Islamic way to choose a ruler? Because the ruler has this kind of authority, then I think that's the way to choose which ruler. I mean, ruler. Uh, that's a big question. But I mean, the general the rule is the ruler is chosen by uh, Bayah. So there's something called the Ahl Halwala. The Ahl Halwala are the people, it means the people who loosen and bind. These are the elites. Exactly who they are, uh, it depends where you are. So they are the ones who uh, pledge allegiance to the ruler and give that ruler legitimacy. And they are the ones who can choose to remove the ruler if the ruler is doing something horrible and just. So uh, there is uh, this notion of bayah or pledging of allegiance is a contractual agreement between the subject and the ruler. The ruler promises to follow the law of God and be just, and the, the, the uh, subjects agree to obey the ruler. If the ruler violates the bayah, then the ahlul halalah, people who lose and bind the elites, can choose to remove that person. Now, what usually happens is, in history, the ruler is some big, hairy, Turkic warrior, 
at least after the 10 hundreds, with about 5,000 Olympian era Turkic warrior cavalry, and they like to drink and go hunting and spend their time in wherever they want. And uh, you know, if they decide to occasionally be unjust, there's not a lot you can do uh, because they're warriors. Perhaps comment or, or, or justify um, modern studies, and I think in particular the Southeast Asian countries, except Brunei, um, who sort of seem to pick and choose the areas of law um, within which they implement through sort of marriage and divorce inheritance, but not criminal Yeah. So the way that, I mean, not all states have offered sort of discreet or clear justifications for this. So some have and some haven't. But I'm going to offer you sort of what goes on, the thinking that led to this and, and, and is used to justify it when that is called. It's uh, <clears throat> Once you say that the ruler has a siasso uh, privilege of choosing between which laws are applied, then, some, okay, by the time you get to the, let's say, 1300s, the Sharia is this giant, you guys have Mr. Potato Head here? You have kids like Mr. Potato Head? It's this potato, and you put like nose and ears and eyes and all stuff onto it. And you have Mr. Potato Head's bucket of parts. No one ever has this when you're a kid? Boy, this only works in the US. Okay, so it's like a, you're, you're creating a doll from all these different parts. So the Sharia is like, a, the, all these medhebs, four <coughs> medhebs, each of those is now massively internally plural. So you have like a massive body of rulings to draw from. So let's say I'm the ruler and I want to have a commercial law that's a lot like French commercial law. I can just say, okay, jurist, so-and-so, restaurant, go, Make something looks like this. And he goes, I'm going to take this from the Hanafi law, and this minority opinion from the Maliki law, and this opinion from the Hanbali law, and then da da da, and I put them all together, and look, this is all the Sharia, right? Yes. And your obligation of the ruler is to uphold the Sharia, yes. And you have a just political siyasa right to, just, to choose which rules to what, yes. There you go. Criminal law, except for the Hadood, has always been discretionary punishment to begin with. So there, if I say, I want to have, instead of like the Ottoman tradition of our books of criminal law, we're just going to use the French books. As long as it doesn't contradict the Sharia. For example, you can't flay somebody alive. You can't chop, you can't mutilate somebody by cutting off their nose or their poking up their eyes. Uh, but uh, if you say, you know, uh, prison, uh, hard labor and prison, as instead of bastinado and execution, this is a always, always been a discretion of the criminal law. In family law, the way they do it is by, again, this mixing and matching process. So, oh, in that uh, Hanafi school of law, if the, the husband's drunk and he issues a divorce decree, the divorce is binding, it's valid. Well, okay, we'll take the Maliki law, but that's not the case. Or in the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can, so you, you mix and match. Where does this become problematic? Because problematic if the ruler introduces a law that clearly contradicts the Sharia. So if I say, and this happened in, in, in Tunisia in 1960 under Habib Bourguiba, he said there's no, uh, people are not allowed to fast during all that. Because we are in, engaged in the jihad of development. <laughs> And, uh, and then he said, and the two, muf the two chief muftis, the Hanafi and the Malik mufti, standing behind me, they're going to give a fatwa, okay, it's a no. And they both, the next day they said, no, this is not okay, they're both required. But the point is, the he, the what only time this doesn't work is if you go and say, for example, you are not allowed to pray. You are required to drink alcohol. You are not allowed to cover your hair if you're a woman. You are not allowed to have a beard if you're a man. This would, that's when these laws will start running up again. Which is why, by the way, the case in Tunisia now, if you 
noticed that there has been, uh, the parliament, there's been a bill to have, uh, uh, to not have the Islamic rules of inheritance. As far as I understand, that's an option. You no longer have to follow the Islamic law of rules of inheritance in that country. You can choose not to. But if they were to say, you cannot follow the Islamic law of inheritance, then any Muslim scholar who, who accepted that and validated that would be, uh, I mean, as far as I know, uh, in big trouble. Because that person would be uh, validating the prohibition of what God has commanded. That's why you have to be really stupid politically, like the people of Judah would do that. For the ruler to take, for example, the French law, um, what was the what kind of what was the kind of assumptions that were going it into? Essentially, I'm thinking about whether you look at it kind of a, what was the conception of Sharia or what was the conception of the French law that allowed for people to say that French law developed somewhere outside of Sharia entirely would take it as a part of Sharia law. And would mount an argument saying that this is just because it doesn't contradict, it is Islamic. Okay, so this is a good question. Uh, it actually gives me an option to say something which is, I think, a good, a useful corrective. Which is, um, that, there's a, there are a lot of assumptions there. You are assuming massive discretion on the part of the state to the ruler. And so what the jurist, uh, one of the ones who was the main part of the jurist was a guy, Abdul Zak who died in 1970, he was a Egyptian. Uh, he, uh, what he said is, look, if, if, you, if the ruler is able to pick between all these different pieces, which are a huge pool now of these different schools of law, and they're internal diversity, um, what's the difference between adding a few more pieces just because they're not from the Quran and the Sunnah, most of these laws, by the way, are not from the Quran and the Sunnah. They're from legal reasoning. Or just analogy on top of analogy on top of analogy on top of analogy after over centuries. So if this French law doesn't contradict the Shulia, there's really not that, not that difference. Now, uh, a number of people said, OK, technically that's true, but let's look Let's look at the message or what's happening behind this process. What you're doing is you're turning away from the law of God to Western law or to secular law. And technically speaking, everything you're doing might be legitimate if you look at it from this point of view. But at the, the end of the day, you have a bunch of guys wearing suits and ties applying French commercial law and Muslims are following it. And that's not what God says in the Quran. If you, those who do not rule by the law, by what God has revealed, are unbelievers. So, you know, politically speaking, you've, you know, the kind of cognitive content of what you've done might be illegitimate, but the political message, the political process you've gone through is abandoning the Islamic tradition and adoption of another. And so though that's where you get kind of an Islamist, uh, either kind of reformist Islamist current, or sometimes a, a more violent uh, attempt to, to unseat states that are seen as now essentially unbelieving godless illegitimate states. That's it? You can talk to me in person. Uh, I'll be here. One last question. Oh, well, she had a question too. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for your nice presentation. Actually, uh, you talked about like Sharia law. So, like in my country, recently government like developed a law like inheritance law. Both male and female get the equal uh, property. So this is against the Islamic law, which like half uh, women will get the half property. Uh, against the male. So in this situation, how to reconcile? Like, as a Muslim, we need to follow the Sharia law, 
also like as a citizen of my country, we also need to follow the law. And yeah. the ruler is also a Muslim. So this is the point of view. So which one you suggest us and how do we conclude this situation? Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. So uh, this is a long discussion, um, which takes a lot of time. I mean, I'll try and answer very quickly and then we can discuss it afterwards. The, uh, what's interesting about it here, I mean, one of the few areas of law that actually has a lot of coverage in the Quran is inheritance. You have a very detailed inheritance law in the Quran. One of the things says that a daughter gets half the inheritance of the son. That's, you can't argue with that. I mean, that's God saying this. What's interesting, though, in Islamic history, legal history, is that um, Muslim scholars are always very happy to create ways for that not to happen. So they'll say, give part of your optional up to one third bequest, up to one third of your estate you can give to anybody, like you would say, you know, the Hong Kong Zoo or something like that. You can give this to the daughter and make up for that account, right? Or you can put your money in a walk uh, bias endowment and then have uh, a certain amount given to each of your children every year or something, you can give it equal. And then in addition, there's this hadith of the prophet in which the prophet says, if you're giving gifts to your children while, they, while you're alive, so inter vivos gifts, give to them equally. So here you have this valorization of the idea of giving equal amounts to your children. Now, the general thinking uh, among Muslim scholars historically is that there's, that there's no reason given for any of this. The assumption is, you give the son more because the son has to take care of his female relatives. If they're not married. He has to pay a dowry when he wants to get married. Uh, so that's why. But that's that's an, that's an assumed reason. That's a retroactively derived reason. But what's interesting is not only do you have this hadith where the prophet says, give to the children equally, but the fact that Muslim scholars historically had no problem finding ways for the dad to give the daughter equal to the son. If they were, they're, they're undermining, if there's a reason for this law, a wisdom behind it, they're undermining that wisdom. My opinion, this is just my opinion, this is John, Jonathan Brown's theory for better or worse. If it's right, I'll make a lot of money. If it's wrong, it's crazy. But my theory is that this is like porky. So the, the inheritance laws are like eat pork. Why do we not eat pork? Because God says so. Why do we pray five times a day and not six times? Because God says so. Why do we fast from Ramadan on a month, other month? Because God says so. Right? Why is it that when you um, women make up fasts for when, when they're menstruating, but they don't make up prayers when they're the prayers they miss when they're menstruating? Because that's what God says. So if it's just what God says. And there's no reason behind it, then there's no, and there hasn't historically been any harm in a state or a scholar or a judge finding ways that makes it possible for a father or mother or whatever to give the daughter equal to the son in this case. So, in that sense, what the government's doing here is totally legitimate. But you have to ask yourself, I have to ask myself if I thought that was actually, I'm not planning to go there tonight anytime soon, but I would ask myself, what are you really trying to do? If what you really think is that Islamic law is unjust, if what you really think is Muslims need to transcend this medieval tradition and embrace a secular world in which you realize that modern values and human rights and all this stuff are really where truth is at and not in God's revealed wisdom, following the precedent of the prophet, then what the state is doing is not legitimate, at least if, from, the, from a Muslim perspective. So here it's really about, um, do you trust the party doing this or not? Do you trust their motivations? Uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I'm not uh, full of trust for the, the current Bangladeshi government, but uh, maybe some people are. You know, lots of Muslim scholars have done exactly that thing. But then the Iranian government, this is an interesting case. The, in Shiite law and in lots of, all, lots of other schools of law, non-Muslim compensation values is less than a Muslim. So if I kill a Christian, 
I only have to, I pay his family or her family less than she or he would pay my family if they killed me. Also, the Iranian government said no. In order to maintain justice between communities, the state will step in and pay that, that difference using Siasha authority. Now, uh, I don't know, it depends on what people think about the Iranian government. They certainly seem to be really concerned about Islam. So, you know, does, does one trust them or not? Or are they, so they're definitely not throwing away, they're definitely not saying we, we just, because they're doing like death to America, all that stuff. They're certainly serious about the Sharia. But so you, you can kind of compare these two cases. Well, thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, give an applause for Professor.